Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is John, um, and uh, as you can see, we're doing things a little bit differently together. Um, we, we hope all the little teething problems we've had uh, coming back together again won't uh, occur in the future, but it doesn't matter if it does, is it? We're here uh, together uh, to be with God. Um, we have the intention, of course, of bringing the children back in for our worship, and in particular to see the baptism of Eniola uh, a little bit later on. So we'll be asking the parents to go and fetch uh, the youngsters. So that is what's going to happen. Um, but before the youngsters come back, because they don't want to be bored uh, with listening to me for uh, such a long time, um, uh, is I'm going to start a new preaching series called Gathering. Now I'm getting a bit of echo, so uh, I presume you are as well. Is there anything I can do to change that? I'll just keep talking while something... Oh, that's, that's better. That's great. So after 18 months of the use of technology well, to communicate, well, we've got a little bit of uh, issues there, but um, uh, and connect with one another, to celebrate with one another. We've done that uh, over technology. We've prayed with one another. We've introduced ourselves to Zoom, and we continue to use it. We've done Bible study virtually. We've listened to online teaching. We've enjoyed podcasts uh, together. Uh, we have done so much to get the message across and therefore be with one, one, one another. One wonders why do we bother to come back together uh, t like this uh, on a Sunday. So over the next three weeks, we're going to address uh, this question, and we're going to ask three questions uh, to address that one question. Is first, why do we gather? The second is what happens and what do we do uh, when we gather? And the third, which obviously gathering implies that the rest of the time we're scattered, is what happens when we scatter. And now, there will be some uh, who will be joining us uh, on live stream uh, from their homes or from their holiday locations, and that's great uh, that they can do that. What I don't want to do is sort of somehow run down live streaming. It's been really a lifeline for us over this period of time. It's been marvelous during this last season, and it continues to be marvelous, especially for those that are unable to come for one reason or another and are able to watch online and have a connection with us as a church. So I don't want you to feel guilty if you're not here with us this morning. Um, it might be the only way, and uh, there are times when it, it is fantastic, and it's great to be able to catch up as well on all of that online stuff during the week, so we don't miss out on any teaching. What I want to do, uh, though, is to paint a captivating picture. Oh, well, that's a challenge for a start, John, isn't it? A captivating picture of what it is to gather together and the importance of doing so, and even more so, the miraculous nature of us coming together as church. So, without further ado, why do we gather? Well, uh, Sam Albury, who is uh, an Anglican uh, minister, really, really good guy, has written a small book called Why Bother With Church? I can tell you it only takes half a day to read it. It's about 95 pages, and I think we can do that. Um, so why do we meet and why bother with church? Why put ourselves out on a Sunday morning when, especially on a really lovely sunny day, we could go to the park? Um, and we would be visiting the park, and we could do what we like within reasons, of course, um, where no one is going to ask us to serve coffee or, or welcome people on the doors or sign them in uh, to the park or put out the ducks, okay? Because that's something we seem to do in church when we gather together. We have jobs for people to do. What I want to say to start with is, well done, everybody who's here this morning for avoiding the park. You'll have time for it a bit later on, but it's great that you've made it this morning. Now, if you look at the definition of uh, together, it's about bringing together and take in from scattered places or sources. I suppose we all knew that. That's not a difficult uh, word uh, to come up with and understand. What we perhaps don't know is that it's used in counselling circles. Uh, the G is for gather. Um, the, the, um, uh, it's a mnemonic, as it were, for counselling circles. So it, the, the G is for, uh, for gather. The A is for ask. 
The T is for tell, the H is for help, uh, the E is for explain, and the R is for return. And I just thought that was an excellent way of explaining what we do when we come together. But I'm not going to sit on uh, Andy's words, you'll be pleased uh, t to know, or Sam's words. Uh, and he's going to do that over the next week. And then um, Carrie is coming to speak to us on scattering. So what we do when we come and when we scatter will be covered in the next few weeks. The most important thing that I want you to understand is that the Greek word for church, oh no, Greek, we're doing this again. With a Greek word, this is really important, is ecclesia. We get lots of things from ecclesia. It's often translated as assembly. That's all it means is an assembly. In Acts chapter 19, it used twice. The first time it's used as a mob coming together. It's translated as ecclesia, a mob. The second time, just a couple of verses later, it talks about a legal assembly. And it wasn't obviously the mob, a legal assembly, but coming before a legal assembly. And it was the word ecclesia. So it's not an uncommon word in Greek. And obviously we've just had the Olympics and uh, they finished. And I don't know if you ever listened to the words of the closing ceremony, but somebody stands up and invites uh, everybody to assemble again in four years time or three years, this particular occasion, to assemble again to continue with the ideal of the Olympic Games. And of course, as we believe that the Olympics have started, or Mount Olympus, who knows, well, we'll wait and see. But it's, it, it started, they would have understood that Greek word of assembly, ecclesia, as they came together. But because Christians met regularly, and more often than most, it very quickly uh, became translated, ecclesia, into the word church. And so we have Christians coming together as their assembly, and it's called church. In Acts chapter 5, very early in the, uh, the, the, the wonderful message of the, the New Testament, it says, Great fear sees the whole ecclesia, the church, as it's used and translated there. So by definition, church is gathering. And you can't have church unless you gather. If church never meets, it is not a church. That's a strong statement, but that's what the word means. It means gathering together. You can't have it if you don't meet. So by definition, it means that today. Hold on to that. Of course, the word church has been used wrongly uh, for years and years and years to describe a building. And of course, we know that's not correct. People don't enter a church the church enters a building. You church have entered this building. St. Stephen's uh, Church, as it's called, isn't as such, but the people of St. Stephen's Church, the church that meets there, they have met in a much older building than this particular one it happens to be. It's also used church, isn't it, as a denomination to describe a denomination, although I reckon that the uh, part of the uh, Pentecostal church uh, has got it about right. They call themselves AOG, the Assemblies of God. I think that really puts it in a nutshell, assembling together. But the Church of England actually isn't a church. It's a collection of churches, local churches and assemblies that meet together. We're part of New Frontiers, and New Frontiers doesn't describe itself as a church. It's a gathering of local churches who are joined together by the same beliefs, by the same passion, and by the same relationship. So we're part of New Frontiers, but not New Frontiers Church. This is the local church meeting together today. So church, it's not just an assembly. So why is it any different to any other assembly that we have? To put it another way, is church just a meeting place for those whose hobby is God? Okay, whose hobby is God? 
Well, as a young Christian, there were choruses or Bible verses that were put to music. So this was some time ago, and it's the ancient past. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, but we sang those with huge passion instead of singing songs or hymns that had been written hundreds and hundreds of years uh, before. Now, one of these choruses, and uh, Trish will remember those, and those are of a certain age, Derek and, and Joan will remember this. It's, we are gathering together unto him. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. We are gathering together unto him. And we sing that with huge passion uh, as we did so. You might say, why haven't you sung it, John? Well, you know why. So what I want to tell you about this song, this was a proper Holy Spirit-inspired song. There was only five chords in this, and I could play them all, uh, even with five strings on my guitar. It was not a difficulty. It was in G, there was D, D7, A minor, all those things. The hardest thing was D7. I mean, that's really proper Holy Spirit. None of this F sharp, seventh, minus something or other. I don't understand it. But everybody could play this, and we did together. We are gathering together unto him. There was also a couple called Carol Carol and Jimmy Owens. They were Americans and they wrote a Christian musical experience which toured the country using local uh, singers and musicians. There was one here that uh, operated uh, in the cathedral. I have got a a copy of the... uh, uh, of what it sounded like. It didn't sound very good. I think it was because of the recording. But what I know is it was a wonderful thing. But it was called Come Together. And the first song was Come Together in Jesus' Name. Therefore, the first reason, the main reason, the most important reason why we come together is because of God in his name and for his sake. Primarily, it's not about us. It's about the uniqueness of our relationship together, which is completely and entirely dependent upon what God has done and who God is. We come together because the Bible tells us, and we know through our own stories and experiences, that God in his mercy has poured out his grace and his love uh, to us through Jesus Christ uh, to enable us to have relationship with him. We know this as Christians as we meet together. But relationship with the creator of this universe, relationship with the king who is above all kings, the God who is above all all gods and we want to thank him and we want to stand in awe of him and we want to honor his name and declare his greatness that is why we gather together now there are many who might say that well my faith is personal i'm going to live it out in private but there was a wonderful baptist minister called jim wallace and he says wrote in his book he said this faith is always personal It has to be to you, always personal, but it's never private. We've not been called into a private faith. Indeed, Romans chapter 10, it's a wonderful passage. It says, if you confess confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a public declaration of what something has happened in, in your life. And today we're going to hear any declare as she is baptized that she is having Christ as Lord of her life. Equally, uh, some might say you don't have to belong to a church to be a Christian. Well, of course, attending a local church doesn't make you a Christian. But God has saved us personally to be a corporate assembly, a community of believers. The great John Wesley said this, the Bible knows nothing of solitary religion, nothing at all. Now the Western individualistic world struggles with that a little bit because as we know it's a bit about the I, the I, the I, you're important as an individual. But actually, although football fans do get that as they come together and, and celebrate, I was not going to mention Arsenal this morning, so I, I won't, okay. Um, but um, football fans get it. But Asian communities get it a lot more than we do in the Western world. They are very much more about community, about the us as a whole. You've heard it said, of course, and I actually have said it myself, that you know the phrase that if Jesus is, is if I was the only one in the world... 
uh, Jesus would have died for me. Anyone in the world who was a sinner, Jesus would have died for meaning. That if I was the only one around who was bad, uh, then Jesus would have died for me. Well, that's not quite right. It is right, of course it is, because he did die for each as individuals. But ultimately, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. He sent it to us all, the whole of the world, plural, and that is important. It's not singular, it's plural. So I wanted to shout out how the Bible describes us as a church. Any phrases that you want to use that describe the church? The body of Christ. The bride of Christ. A city on a hill. The priesthood, royal priesthood. Couple more, don't be shy. You know. A holy nation. It's coming now. Oh, I'm going to quote the verse in a minute. Okay. And one more. What about the people of God? I mean, that's the general one, isn't it? That's a good one. Not the person of God, the people of God. So we've got all those, the family of God, we become children, a God's household, it's described, the holy nation we've got, royal priesthood, a body made up of many parts, the people of God, the bride of Christ, the army of God. It talks about being soldiers, uh, uh, on, not on civilian pursuits. But 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it'll come up, it says this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So many plurals all in one place. What a verse uh, to remember, to capture what it is that the church is and why we gather. We're also described as individuals as ambassadors. And if there's an ambassador, if we're ambassadors, what does it mean that there also is? A nation? A nation? Something quite important. An embassy. An embassy. There has to be an embassy. So as church, we are an embassy as well. An outpost in a foreign land, as it's described. It's so significant because, of course, we're described in the beginning of Peter as aliens, as strangers in the world. And this gathering place, this embassy, is a sanctuary. It's a safe place. It's a place of identity it's a place that says we belong to Christ here he is our king in him we serve and pick up Jones point church is part of God's overseas territory it's him uh, uh, having his people in this land it's where God's ways apply where his heart and what he wants to do in this world comes out to the fore and can be seen by everyone else. So the church is a particular gathering of Christian believers. It was always God's intention. In the story of Moses and the exodus of Israel from Egypt, they came to Mount Sinai. And it is here that the people of God, all of them, the millions of them, come together Though there are lots of rules and uh, really tricky bits associated with that. But that's where God's people met together. Now in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, who was just about to be killed and martyred, um, he describes this event in this particular way. He describes it as an assembly. It was the Greek word when they met together in Mount Sinai as an assembly, an ecclesia. Now, Sam Albury, in his book, puts it like this. At the foot of Mount Sinai, the people of God were churching together. And churching here means more than just hanging out over a latte, although we haven't got any coffee today. We've stopped coffee for the moment, but uh, there we will come back perhaps at some stage. This gathering was marked by it being in the presence of God, receiving his words of promise and direction and being constituted as his people. The weekly meeting of Christians is a reenactment of this moment 
Christians gather as the people of God to receive words afresh, to be reconstituted and recommissioned as his. That's brilliant. He goes on to say, so as well as being a gathering of Christian believers, it is a gathering in a particular location of God's people, as his people, in his presence to hear and respond to his word. So Ecclesia, when applied to church, carries a richness of this Old Testament that carries through from the very beginning until the very end. I'd like us to stand if we could. Can you do that? Can you just stand if you're able? And you can look around at each other as I say this. Look at each other and say, see this. You church are a blood bought people devoted to the worship of the one true God set apart from the world committed to being part of church throughout the week to serve one another and to love your neighbors that's who you are you can sit down now And of course, that last part is the scattering, which um, I'm not going to talk about anymore. The second reason uh, we gather is for others. The well-known verses from Hebrews chapter 10 uh, say this, and let us consider how may we, we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together is the habit of some, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We meet to see one another and to encourage uh, one another. I, I recently read a story of a church gathering where the leader stood up and asked the congregation for stories of answered prayer. One lady uh, came forward and uh, got the mic and she said that just, she just moved to the town and to this church, but that a year ago her husband Bob had had a major cycling accident and he had shattered his scrotum. The men in the congregation took a sharp intake of breath and screwed up their faces, um, feeling the pain. Um, she went on, the doctors didn't think he would live at first, but we prayed in my church uh, and he survived. And there, then, piece by piece, the doctors put back together his scrotum. After the op, it was extremely painful to walk. And again, the men in the church in particular winced. And Bob couldn't pick up the children at all. So the church prayed once more. And I can tell you that Bob is fully healed. Well, the church went mad. They were so delighted. They re roared with relief in particular. Uh, and then the church leader said to the congregation, that's terrific, is, is there anyone else that wants to share anything? And a man came forward to the mic. He said, my name is Bob. And the church looked up in warmth and sympathy, of course, as well. And he said, this is a message for my wife. The word is sternum. <laughs> I didn't tell Catherine I was going to share that joke. She would have said to me, don't tell it in church. <laughs> but today, we've encouraged each other by sharing about something for nothing. If you happen to be there, every one of us will say that it was a wonderful time to be together in fellowship and also a wonderful time of sharing with the community. It was terrific. Six weeks ago, we shared about Alex Natung and his family in the Democratic Republic of Congo. His sister had been killed, and it was killed by the army, and by the army. She'd been looking after her mother, lived with her mother, who's very elderly, can't move very far. But she was killed mostly because she was a member of the Tutsi uh, tribe. 
And not only that, Alex's brother had been arrested for no real reason at all. There was no real charge against him. That was a separate incident. We came together as a church on that following Monday and we prayed, and we prayed online, thank you Lord, for technology. Um, and the great news is that Alex's mum, who was really isolated in that place and very vulnerable, she's been rescued and flown uh, to Rwanda. And that as the army goes away, Alex tells me uh, that it looks as though his brother will be released, the charges will be dropped entirely. What a wonderful encouragement that Joan wants to clap on there. Let's just clap the Lord on that. What a wonderful encouragement uh, uh, and answer to prayer that is. And it isn't always like that, but when it is, let's come together to pray. So as well as encouragement, our gatherings are to look out uh, for one another. That's why we meet. Here you can see the faces. I know we've got masks on at the moment, but go outside and you can see each other. You can see people crying through certain songs. You maybe see people in quiet reflection during the worship. Maybe they're just there after a period of real difficulty and what a testimony that is that they're actually there. You look out and you see people supporting one another, praying for one another, pointing folk to Jesus. There's so much more that Sam is going to bring to us next week about what we do when we meet together. But it is about all those things as to why we gather. Sadly, of course, one of the things that we occasionally hear people say is that I didn't get anything from this morning. I didn't like the songs. Wasn't keen on the preaching. Please be careful with your feedback to me. I, I didn't like... I didn't like uh, all that stuff, and uh, I get more out of the stuff online, a lot better online. Um, the preaching doesn't really help me to grow uh, very much. It, it, it's too long. No one talks to me uh, when I come. The meeting goes on uh, too long. Uh, quite frankly, at times, it can be boring. Well, the truth is, yeah, it can be. There are times when we do put things across, really good things, really right things, but we can put them across in a fairly dull way at times. And it can be, for some, a little bit boring. Where else, for instance, do you listen to a 30-minute monologue, except perhaps when you go and see a stand-up comedian? And this is hardly a stand-up comedian performance. It's hardly that. We try to do the right things. We might have, of course, about 200 adults here, and we're all very different, different cultures, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different understanding and education. Again, Sam Albury puts it like this, primarily, church is not for our entertainment as a consumer, but for you and others to find encouragement as a contributor. A lot of our experience of church has to do with the mindset with which we arrive each week. My challenge is therefore to us all is, what are we bringing? Do not underestimate the positive impact that you can have on others if you're coming for looking ways uh, to support each other. The third reason why we gather is actually for yourself. Clearly when the writer wrote to the Hebrews, he had heard reports that some people had got out of the habit of meeting, and that had become the new habit, not meeting. Now, we're mostly creatures of habit, aren't we? Well, I am, certainly. The moment we put something above meeting together, we're in danger of making that the habit. We stop Sundays, we stop small group, we stop interaction uh, on social uh, media, and then we stop. I would want to see every member here every single week, except, of course, for holidays and sickness. And I want to see people here every week for two reasons. The first is actually because I love you. And I want to see you. I want to see all your faces. And I miss you when you're not here. The second reason is, is because I am fearful that you will drift away and remove yourself from a place where you can be encouraged and built up in God. That's why we talked earlier about being a body or a family. 
Your presence and your gifts are vital to the body and family. And using them always builds you up as well as others. We're all different, some extroverts, some introverts, some loud, some quiet, some well-off, some not so well-off, some clever, some not so clever, some great with people, some absolutely useless with people. But you have a place, you have a home, you have a welcome, and you have a role. And we all need encouragement, help to grow, and support in times of need. And a bigger picture we need to be encouraged in is a bigger picture of our God and who he is. So we started with the question, why do we gather? But I want to end with another, which is why on earth would we not gather? I talked earlier about the church being described and somebody called out in Revelation as the bride of Christ. The Bible tells us clearly that at the end of the age, Christ will return as an aside i i was encouraged this week by or last week it was by a tabloid front page a headline and it said the return of chris okay now i wasn't encouraged about the impending return of cristiano ronaldo which is what it was talking about uh, to manchester united but i was encouraged that the editor of the newspaper thought that the return of Christ was a well-known phrase in our language still in society that he chose to mimic that uh, phrase in talking about Cristiano Ronaldo. When Christ does return, it will, it says, gather his church from the ends of the earth, the great ingathering of his people, and he will take us as his bride. What an extraordinary and beautiful picture that is and future for us all. The Bible also says that we are making ourselves ready as a bride, making ourselves more beautiful and probably more pure and spotless and therefore beautiful. There is no doubt, church, as we look around, uh, we are by no means perfect. Don't look for us to be perfect in church. We will fall short of that. There is much wrong with us. It means to me that at the moment, we're in the ugly stage a little bit. Now, I was going to say, could you turn to one another and say, do you know you're looking a bit ugly today? But I thought some of you would do it with a bit more passion than I wanted you to do. But listen up. Just as the sight of his bride makes a groom's heart well up with love, church, we should overflow with affection for one another when you look around this room. We might drive each other bonkers at times, but we are all going to be part of the bride of Christ bought by his death. As I look out, I remember This is the people who have committed to care for me, put up with my faults and jokes, and point me to Jesus again and again. Church, let's all look towards the greatest and biggest gathering of all time. And I long for us all to be there.